In the last video, we have learned the equation of state for ADL gases. In this video, we examine what happens when ADL behavior is not warranted. All right, so uh, making memory of the ADL gas equation of state is just an equation that relates the four variables that determine the physical state of a substance, All right? And it, ha it has a very uh, uh, trivial aspect, and it's very easy to use as well. You can learn a lot of information about uh, the properties of gases under normal conditions, All right? But uh, uh, this equation does not always apply. It turns out that there are some uh, uh, conditions that break down the ideality model here. And uh, generally, you can actually break down ideality by increasing pressure. And we're going to see how that works in this video. Now, uh, a way to actually uh, characterize whether you are uh, in ideal behavior or not is to calculate something that is called the compression or compressibility factor. Okay, notice that we can define that compressibility factor simply as uh, uh, capital C, and that is just going to be PV over NRT, right? Notice that this value should be equal to one if this gas is ideal, right? Because uh, that expression, right, divide both sides of the equation by NRT, and you will have uh, the compression factor, and on the right-hand side you will have a one. So that is the expe expectation for an ideal gas. Right, but uh, this is something that you can actually measure. What you can do is uh, try to plot how that uh, compression factor, Z, behaves as a function of pressure. And, uh, and again, the, it, it turns out that uh, a breakdown from ideality is experienced at high pressures, right? So we start here at low pressures, but then we're gonna go maybe to 100 atmospheres uh, right here. And then maybe here we have about 200 atmospheres and here we will have even larger atmospheres. Okay, notice that uh, the compression factor can never be negative, right? So all of the values are going to be positive, and the ideal value is going to be one. Now, if uh, the gas that you're interested in, and this could be oxygen or nitrogen or CO2 or methane or argon, any gas, right? If that behaves ideally, then you would expect to actually have this value of the compression factor be one regardless of the pressure, right? So the ideal behavior will be a line that behaves like this, right? That C is one at all pressures, which means that this equation applies at all pressures. And we're gonna label this simply as ideal. But it turns out that uh, gases do not behave like this uh, and, uh, under all pressures, right? So uh, at low pressures, they do uh, uh, capture this value of C1 but as long as, as, as soon as you start to increase the pressure to values that are maybe 10, 20, 30 atmospheres, so that is pretty high pressure, then you start to see departures from this trend. Uh, I'm going to draw here a couple of gases at room temperature. Okay, so one of them is going to be nitrogen. And for nitrogen, what you have is a graph that looks more or less like this. First, this compression factor drops, but then it actually goes up and it turns over. Okay? And this will be the line for nitrogen. And again, the temperature is constant at uh, room temperature, so 298 Kelvin. Now, for hydrogen, what you actually have is a graph that looks like this. Okay? All right, so let's see what this means. Okay, notice that what you have here for nitrogen is that in this range right there, the compression factor is actually lower than what you would expect in the ideal case. All right, and uh, the breakdown from the ideal case is because interactions between the gas particles start to be important. Okay, so what type of interactions lead to a decrease in the compression factor? Okay, so what that, if you have a compression factor less than one, what that means is that when you're trying to apply pressure to that gas, that gas is easier to compress than an ideal gas. All right, so, so the, the only way that you can have a gas that is easier to compress than an ideal gas is that if the gas is experiencing attractions, because if the gas molecules are attracting each other, right, the volume is decreasing of that gas, and that means that this gas is actually easier to compress. Right? So in this range right here, you're uh, breaking apart from ideality because the dominant forces between those particles are attraction. In an ideal gas, this is no interactions whatever, right? So you don't have that dip. 
right? But then it turns out that if you actually start to compress that gas a lot, okay, now the gas molecules are going to be very, very close to each other, right? So um, this will be kind of the initial situation where you have these gas molecules right there, but then you start to apply a lot of pressure, which means that you're reducing the volume tremendously, and now all those gas molecules are going to be jammed in a very small region of space, right? And so forth. And what happens is that those molecules are really close to each other. And when they get uh, sufficiently close to each other, then repulsions start to take over. There's this penetration of the electronic clouds between the gas particles and they repel each other. So that's when this turns over, right? Notice that you're trying to compress a gas, but the gas particles are repelling each other. And that means that that gas is harder to compress than if there were no interactions at all, which is the ideal case. Okay, so once you turn over from here, then what that means is that the repulsions of between those gas particles are taken over. Now in H2, what happens is that you actually have the repulsions dominate at 288 Kelvin throughout the pressure range. And what that means is that the attractions between H2 molecules must be very small, right? Because they're uh, completely overwhelmed by repulsions uh, at all pressures. Okay, so, so that's something that actually this type of graphs, this study of gases, really informs about the strength of the interactions and the type of the interactions that you have between gas particles. Okay, uh, something important about this graph is that even though the ideal gas equation is not going to, going to work uh, at pressures uh, slightly above uh, ambient, it actually works really well right at pressures that are close to atmospheric pressure right so at one atmosphere which will be right here you actually have that ideal gas equation of state applies very nicely okay and that that's that's nice because again we can use it in many problems that are important in the life sciences right uh, but if you're interested in problems in which the pressure of the gas is really high so maybe you're looking at uh, planetary atmospheres with really high pressures or maybe you're looking at the behavior of gases uh, uh, deep underground where the pressures are really high, then the ideal gas equation of state would not work. Instead, we're going to have to use a different equation of state that is able to account for this type of behavior of the compression factor. Okay, and as a matter of fact, in the next video, we're going to see uh, the most famous uh, ideal gas equation of state, actually a gas equation of state, which uh, is not ideal. Right, so there will be the first non-ideal gas equation of state, which is the Van der Waals equation of state, and it's able to capture some of this behavior. Now, that Van der Waals equation of state is quite important because uh, it was kind of the first time that uh, people thought about interactions between gas uh, between gas particles, and it actually that type of work uh, got uh, Van der Waals the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1920.